giant armoured spiders, ancient witches, dark gods, avocados. From Aquamentus through to Dark Beast Ganon, the Zelda games have featured bosses of all shapes and sizes, strengths, weaknesses and difficulties. Finding the big key and heaving open a dungeon's boss door, unaware of what lurks on the other side, is what Zelda is about, having the courage to face any evil. But not all Zelda bosses are created equal. Many are absolutely fantastic, others less so. So today, let's run through the entire Zelda series in order of release, and pick out my choice for the best boss battle in each. It goes without saying that this list will be heavily opinion based. I'm not ranking them on how tough they are to beat, but on a multitude of factors that I think are important for a good Zelda boss. Not just difficulty, but their design, music, lore, and just how much fun I think the battles against them are. Let's get into it. Being the first game in the series, Zelda 1's bosses don't have a huge amount of depth to them, and many are reused in later dungeons. One of the most reused bosses is my absolute favourite, however, Gliok. Appearing as a giant, multi-headed green dragon, Gliok guards the Triforce in level 4, shows up as a mini-boss in level 6, and again serves as the main boss in level 8, gaining an extra head with each appearance. It's fought by cutting its heads from its body, which then fly around the room attacking Link with fireballs until the last one is severed. Obviously, the more heads there are, the more difficult the fight becomes, and the last fight against a four-headed Gliok is pretty challenging. It's a straightforward boss fight that doesn't rely on a gimmick like the use of a certain niche item to beat it. The player needs to rely on just their sword and their ability to evade damage. At the end of Adventure of Link's Great Palace, Link famously comes face to face with his own shadow. The game's final boss, and the final trial before he earns the Triforce of Courage, is himself. My favourite boss in the game, though, comes just before. The Thunderbird. Apparently created by the King of Hyrule in order to protect the Triforce piece, the Thunderbird is a bizarre, winged creature resembling a statue or sarcophagus. Fittingly, for the penultimate boss of the most difficult Zelda game, the Thunderbird is no joke. It's entirely invulnerable until weakened with the Thunder Spell, which uses at least half of Link's magic meter, and rains down torrents of fireballs while floating around the room. The fight is made a bit easier by using the Reflect spell, allowing Link's shield to block the fire, but the boss still requires incredibly precise jump attacks to defeat. After collecting the three pendants and pulling the Master Sword, Link is cast into the Dark World, a sinister reflection of Hyrule. Its first dungeon is the Palace of Darkness, and as you'd expect, for the first boss fought in this nightmarish new dimension, the palace's maiden is guarded by a titanic monster, the Helmosaur King. A giant version of the little Helmosaur enemy, it attacks with fireballs and with its huge spiked tail. The boss's special mechanic is simple but really satisfying. Its head is guarded by the helmet for which it is named, which must be cracked with the hammer or bombs in order to damage its vulnerable face. Link must duck in and out of its attacks while chipping away at the mask. Link's Awakening somehow managed to cram some really interesting bosses onto the Game Boy, like Slime Eel or the Evil Eagle. However, my favourite boss in the game has to be its final challenge, the Shadow Nightmares. Fought inside the Windfish's egg, the Nightmares are responsible for the god's endless slumber. The Nightmares are shadows that take multiple forms from Link's past, like Moldorm and Aghanim. It even has a Ganon form, who will throw a shadowy trident around the room. The boss's final form, Death Eye, requires Link to hop over its increasingly fast arm swings while taking shots at its eye, which can be pretty difficult. Overall, because of its different forms and difficulty, it's my pick for Link's Awakening's best boss. Ocarina of Time features a solid number of truly iconic bosses, like Volvagia and Bongo Bongo, but my absolute favourite boss fight in the game is against the story's ultimate evil, Ganon. I've talked before about just how much I love the game's final battle, and it's almost entirely down to the fight's atmosphere. After his defeat, Ganondorf uses the last of his power in a desperate attempt to kill the hero and the princess, collapsing his tower while they stand atop it. The pair narrowly escape, but this isn't the end. From the rubble and broken stonework, the Gerudo King rises into the air, brandishing the Triforce of Power on the back of his hand. 
Now completely consumed by his lust for power, Ganondorf transforms, taking on a terrible new form as the Demon King Ganon. This fight is the only one in the game without a subtitle. The screen simply reads, Ganon. You know who this is. Ganon knocks the Master Sword from Link's hand, forcing him to rely on other items he's obtained throughout his adventure. While the 3DS version of the game brightened up this final section, in the original it's almost completely dark. Only Ganon's silhouette can be seen as the sky flashes with lightning. The music isn't particularly epic or heroic, instead it's serious and mournful, perfectly capturing the feeling of being trapped with an insurmountable evil, alone without the Blade of Evil's Bane. While the fight itself isn't very complicated, Link just needs to keep hitting the beast's vulnerable tail before delivering a final blow, it's the perfect end to what is still perhaps Link's greatest adventure, and a perfect way to mark the birth of the boar demon Ganon into the Zelda storyline. In Ocarina of Time, the Goron Mask unlocks some hidden dialogue with certain characters. In Majora's Mask, it turns you into a powerhouse that can curl up into a spiked ball and roll around at max speed. It's awesome in the limited places you can effectively use it, so it's no surprise that an entire boss fight designed around it is by far the most fun battle in the game. Goat is the boss of the Snowhead Temple. It's a giant mechanical horned goat, found frozen in a giant block of ice. Once thawed, it will rampage around a huge room shaped like a track, and Link needs to chase it down using the Goron Mask. The track is full of ramps, and Goat attacks by throwing lightning bolts and causing rocks to fall from the ceiling. It can be damaged by smashing into it with a roll, which eventually causes it to collapse. Though both versions of Majora's Mask have a few lacklustre bosses, Goat absolutely isn't one of them. It's great fun in both games. Oracle of Ages Ramrock is a four-phase showdown against an ancient stone golem. At first, it tries to punch Link, and by hitting its fists with the sword, Link can make it smack itself in the head. Next, it swaps out the stone hands for two crushers, and jumps around the room trying to mash Link into a paste. This second phase can be cleared by timing bomb throws as its crushers slam together. Ramrock then swaps out for two shields, making it completely invulnerable to attack from the front, and starts firing balls of energy and laser beams from its eyes as it moves around the room. It can only be damaged by bouncing seed shots off of the back wall. Finally, it pulls out two wrecking balls which it fires alternately, which can be pulled back and flung into the golem to finish it off. It's a pretty tough fight, and makes use of a whole bunch of items Link has collected throughout his adventure. Oracle of Seasons began development as a remake of the original Zelda game, and so features redesigns of many of the first game's bosses. This includes the return of Gliok as the boss of the Explorer's Crypt. At first, the fight seems pretty much the same as the original. Link needs to sever its two heads, which will fly around the room when cut off. However, there's a surprise second phase. After its heads are destroyed, the headless skeletal remains of the dragon will charge and jump around the room causing earthquakes, which is just awesome. Four Swords introduced the Wind Mage Varti, who kidnaps Zelda and takes her to his palace in the sky. Link pulls the Four Sword and splits into four identical copies, who would venture through Hyrule until they finally reach Varti in the Palace of Winds. Four Swords doesn't have many bosses, and the Varti battle is by far the best of them. Phase 1 starts with a mage possessing a statue, of himself, then flying around the arena on a cyclone, and the Links need to use bombs to bring him down. Afterwards, Varti attacks in his true form, and the main battle begins. Varti has multiple different attack phases. There's a Dead Man's Volley, a Zelda staple, but with the added challenge that coloured balls must be hit by the Link of the same colour, summoning a ring of winged skulls, and spinning its arms around before opening their petal-like ends, showing the colours of the Links that need to attack it next. The Hero of Winds is somewhat notable because he isn't connected to the bloodline of the Hero of Time like Twilight Princess's Link. He's just a boy from a remote island on a quest to rescue his sister. Because of this, the game's story focuses on this Link proving himself worthy of the title of Hero, a plot which comes to a head in the Tower of the Gods. 
After collecting the three goddess pearls, the tower rises from the depths of the Great Sea, an ancient labyrinth designed to test potential heroes. It has a strange technology theme which contrasts with the clearly ancient stone tower, and the dungeon is filled with Bemos, Armos, and other automata. Its boss is the same, Godan, the Arbiter of the Gods. As Link enters the boss's chamber, what appears to be a statue on the far wall begins to speak, offering one final challenge. Godan activates with pulses of blue light and floats towards Link, a disembodied head and two hands. This isn't a unique boss design by any means, not even unique to Zelda games, but I think that this is one of the best examples of it. Link needs to dodge its swipes and strike the eye on the palm of each hand with an arrow, causing the head to open its eyes. It then attacks by vomiting fireballs, but if each eye is hit, it will sink to the ground, allowing Link to damage it by placing a bomb in its mouth. Again, it's not a unique boss design or battle, but it's done very well. It's fun to fight, its design is strange but striking, its theme music alien but epic. Towards the end of the Minish Cap, Link takes to the cloud tops in search of the final element. The Palace of Winds is suspended in the sky far above Hyrule. Link fights and jumps through floating stone halls with precarious edges opening onto the empty sky. But for the dungeon's boss fights, he doesn't even have any ground to stand on. The Gyorg pair fly through the open air, and Link needs to jump between their backs to survive. The boss is a pair of giant flying rays, a small blue male and a large red female. By cloning himself with his sword, Link can attack the eyes of the female, and after it takes enough damage, jump onto and fight the male by hopping over its tail and hitting its eye. The fight gets progressively more difficult with each phase, with fireballs and mini Georg to dodge. The Georg pair is one of the most creative 2D Zelda boss battles, and my favourite in the Minish Cap by far. The bosses of Four Swords Adventures are recycled and reimagined from other games in the series, namely A Link to the Past and The Wind Waker. The main antagonist for most of the game, though, is Varty, and he's fought at the end, but there's a twist. It's revealed that Ganon himself has been behind much of the game's events. This Ganon is an entirely new reincarnation of the Demon King, a massive wizard boar wielding the trident stolen from the desert. The boss fight is somewhat similar to in A Link to the Past, where he teleports around the room while throwing the tridents, and even the music is the same. He can throw bolts of lightning at the links though, as well as send them to the Dark World, where they have to fight off Stalfos to return. After Ganon takes some damage, Princess Zelda joins the fight. She'll summon an orb of light, and must be defended against the demon's attacks while it charges. There's no way to deal enough damage to kill Ganon without it. All the Lynx can do is hold him off until Zelda's magic is ready. By timing a shot with a light arrow to pierce the Orb of Light, the Lynx can end the fight and imprison Ganon within the Four Sword. It's a great twist on the classic Ganon fight from A Link to the Past, and a fun boss to end the game with. For Twilight Princess, here's another boss I've talked about before, Stalord of the Arbiter's Grounds. It's a giant reanimated dragon skeleton fought while riding a Beyblade, it doesn't get much better than that. The first phase of the boss fight takes place in a sand pit, where Stalord is immobilized from the waist down. Link needs to avoid the beast's poison breath and the skeletons that crawl up from the sand in order to smash into Stalord's spine, eventually breaking it and collapsing its body. The skull falls to the floor, and the arena empties of sand. Only the boss's skull remains, lifeless on the stone floor. By turning a set of gears with the spinner, Link raises a central column, completely changing the boss room, and turns to find Stalord reanimated once more, a floating skull with glowing red eyes. The second phase begins. Link rides the tracks in the outer wall and central pillar with the spinner, jumping between the two to avoid its fireballs. Colliding with Stalord's skull causes it to drop to the ground, where Link can strike the scimitar that was used to resurrect it to end the fight. Stalord's design and theme music are brilliant. It's not a conventional boss at all, and it makes great use of a criminally underutilized item in the spinner, making it my favorite boss fight in the game. Phantom Hourglass's Muto's Temple is a desert pyramid, the ruins of an ancient civilization. 
Within are booby traps to deter outsiders, like roller traps, spiked floors, and a giant mechanical stone golem. The dungeon's boss, Eox, is absolutely huge. It takes up both screens and stomps around the room trying to punch Link and firing arrows at him. By jumping from springs around the room, Link can use the hammer to smash bolts on Eox, eventually collapsing his brickwork down to a wooden frame, then to nothing, only his head bouncing around, firing out arrows, with its weak spot exposed, a crystal on the top of its head. The boss of the Sand Temple, the ancient demon Skeldritch, or Capbone as it's known in Europe, is similar in a lot of ways to Stalort. Both fights are against skeletons standing in the middle of a pit of sand and are damaged by hitting their spine. Oh, and both fights are amazing. The Skeldritch boss battle makes great use of the dungeon item, the Sand Wand. The boss throws boulders at Link, but these can be blocked by raised sand and directed onto catapults to be fired back at the boss, each destroying a vertebrae of its spine and lowering it further into the sand. The upper spine is armoured at the front, so Link needs to load catapults, then pull its attention away and trigger the throw with an arrow, while it shoots laser beams out of its mouth at you. Once its spine has been completely destroyed, the skull falls into the sand and its helmet comes off. But, just like Stalord, it's still not dead. The skull charges around the pit, but by immobilising it with the sand wand, Link can reach the crystal on its back to end the fight. Coloctus is a possessed, ancient god machine that you smash to pieces with its own giant scimitars. There's not a lot else I can say, it's just a brilliant boss. Link enters the chamber, only to find Girahim laughing at him. The Demon Lord revives the automaton with dark magic, and the machine built to defend the ancient system now hunts the hero. At first, Koloktos is only an immobilised head and torso with multiple arms, but after taking some damage, will break free of the ground, lock its weak spot behind a cage, and pull out six massive golden scimitars. By using the whip to pull at its joints, Link can grab hold of its great swords and use them to violently break apart the machine's chest, making it one of the most satisfying boss fights in the whole series. A Link Between Worlds reimagines many of the bosses from A Link to the Past, like how the Helmosaur King returns as the Gemosaur King, a beast covered in rupee ore. My favourite boss, though, is the reimagined Blind, Stal Blind. The boss of the Thieves' Hideout is a huge red skeleton wielding a great sword and shield. At first, it seems invulnerable to all damage. It attacks by swinging its sword or vomiting shadows, but its shield protects it against Link's own blade. However, the flat face of its shield allows Link to wall merge with it, and jump out on the boss's weak rear to damage it. It's such a creative use of the wall merge mechanic, but then Stalblind realises this and throws the shield away. It can now be damaged from the front, but now it attacks faster and performs huge spin attacks. Enough hits will start the final phase. Stalblind's head starts floating around the room spewing darkness while its body violently hacks away with the sword. It's a really fun boss with a great design. You've probably noticed a trend by now. Big skeleton bosses are cool and Triforce Hero's Stal Champion is no different. It's the boss of the Desert Temple, an Egyptian-themed undead warrior with a mace instead of a left hand. It's fought by hitting it from behind until the skeleton collapses, allowing the Lynx to attack its heart with their hammers while its mace rolls around the arena trying to crush them. After enough damage, Phase 2 begins. Stal Champion's skull starts to float, swallows its heart, then starts to burn with a purple flame just like a bubble, a classic Zelda enemy. The skull charges around the arena at the Lynx and can be brought down by the boomerang. It's not a difficult fight, nor is it particularly creative, but it's a fun fight against a big skeleton, so it's on my list. Breath of the Wild does a lot of things well. Exploration and movement, environments and world building, puzzles and dungeon design. But one thing it didn't quite nail was its bosses. They're far too few in number, and are repeated far too often. The overworld bosses are all great, but that's only three bosses with multiple variants, Talises, Hinox, and Mulduga. 
The bosses of the main dungeons, the Blight Ganons, are so similar in design that they feel like different phases of the same boss. And the same is true for Calamity Ganon itself, which combines elements from all four Blights into an admittedly fun, challenging battle. And, of course, the less said about Dark Beast Ganon, the better, which plays more like an interactive cutscene than an actual boss fight. Master Koga is the only base game boss that isn't another variant of Ganon and isn't repeated over and over. Admittedly, the boss of the Yiga clan is played for laughs, and Koga eventually ends up killing himself with a giant boulder, but it's a fun fight nonetheless, as the master makes use of different ancient Chica techniques. However, having the bumbling, clumsy Koga as the only living example of a Sheikah master was a little disappointing. We know from Hyrule's history that Sheikah monks did once fight alongside the Guardians and Divine Beasts, and we could only wonder at how powerful a serious Sheikah master could be. This was until the game's second DLC pack dropped, the Champion's Ballad. Link is contacted by the mysterious Maz Koshia, a Sheikah monk who tests those who desire to pilot a divine beast. Link undergoes these trials, until finally he stands before the monk's podium, just like at the end of a regular shrine. However, instead of rewarding the hero with a spirit orb and fading away, Maz Koshia's fossilized fingers begin to twitch, and the ancient monk breaks his millennia-long meditation to stand up and challenge Link to a final trial. The fight itself takes place on a huge Sheikah platform floating above Hyrule. There are three phases. First, the monk begins by fighting similarly to a Yiga foot soldier, by teleporting around and attacking with a guardian sword. Next, he splits himself into multiple copies, with only one vulnerable to damage. Finally, Maz Koshia grows to a giant size, and begins to use moves like firing guardian laser beams out of his face, throwing spiked metal balls, and trying to crush Link. It's the most difficult boss battle in the game, made even better by the build-up and circumstances surrounding the fight. Throughout the entire game, Link has been tested by Sheikah machines, puzzles, and traps, but for the final trial, it couldn't have ended any other way than an ancient Sheikah master personally challenging Link to single combat. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, leave a like or subscribe if you haven't already for more Zelda content. What would your picks be for the best boss in each Zelda game? Let me know in the comments. Cheers guys, and I'll see you next time.